Madam Chair, Honorable Committee, my name is Richard Van Whipler. I'm a lifelong resident of New Hampshire and have served for the last 25 years also in law enforcement. And I continue to do so as the superintendent of the Cheshire County Department of Corrections. I do not represent Cheshire County here today. I've taken vacation to be here in order to testify as a member of law enforcement against prohibition. LEAP is a nonprofit organization consisting of law enforcement officers, judges, corrections professionals, former DEA agents, Homeland Security agents, and United States Marshals who believe that the war on drugs policy of the United States is a failed policy. House Bill 492 is smart and responsible legislation, and I speak in favor of this bill. To begin my testimony, it has to be clear that I do not, and LEAP does not, advocate the use of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, or any non-prescribed medications. This discussion and this bill is about our drug policy and the effects of that policy. In considering drug policy in our state and in our nation, we have to ask ourselves these following questions. Is what we're doing effective toward creating a drug-free society? That, after all, is the mission of the drug war. Secondly, has crime been reduced because of our current policies? Third, are we safer as a community because of those policies? Fourth, are the costs of incarceration and the surveillance associated with these laws justified? Criminal justice policy should be about promoting public safety and preventing crime. Our current policies on drug policy do not achieve this. In my study of drug war policy, I utilize government-produced data that is funded by our tax dollars and also reputable research from widely acceptable sources to reach my conclusions. As for a policy that protects our citizens, consider that each of the year in the United States alone, tobacco kills 435,000 people. Poor diet and physical inactivity kills 365,000 people. Alcohol kills 85,000. Motor vehicle crashes 26,000. The illicit use of all illegal drugs combined kills 17,000 people. And the use of marijuana has not killed one person ever in its history. The Drug Enforcement Agency has indicated that 75% of the gang war violence in our communities is over illegal drug marketplace disputes. That's what fuels drug crime amongst gangs. The violence associated with drug use in our country is not because of the substances themselves, but it's because of the prohibition of those substances. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country. We have 5% of the world's population, but yet we have 25% of the world's inmates. We now have 2.7 million people behind bars. We have over 7 million people in our correctional system. Consider that 114 million Americans have admitted to using an illegal drug in their lifetime, and 34 million Americans have admitted to using in the last 12 months. The, pro the majority of those, by far, of course, is for marijuana. Now, here's the problem. If we take this into consideration and assume that we can arrest our way out of this under our current laws, then we have to increase our national jail bed space of 2.4 million jail beds to at least 35 million to achieve the current goals and policies that we have. We already have a system that we can no longer afford. A vote in favor of this bill, here's what it will do. It's a vote that will end discrimination against harmless people. It's a vote that will put illegal drug dealers out of business. Incidentally, the difference between decriminalization and legalization is that decriminalization allows and permits the black market to remain in place and provide for that product. A legalized, regulated system puts the illegal drug dealer out of business. This is a vote to reduce crime. This is a vote to increase public safety. It's a vote to more wisely spend criminal justice resources. It's a vote to earn revenue that is fair and widely accepted among the constituency. I know that this bill doesn't have a fiscal note, but I do know in the Seattle Times, they have given the, the, the uh, structuring to the Liquor Commission for the state of Washington. They estimate uh, $2 billion conservatively in the first year, and that's with 185,000 pounds sold in the first year, they estimate. So this is a vote that is responsible and it's smart. 
and it's based on solid evidence. It's not based on anecdotal evidence. It's a vote that will greatly assist in keeping it out of the hands of minors because it's regulated and controlled and more difficult for minors to access. The students who testified today just told you that marijuana and alcohol is easier to get. I'm sorry, that the illegal substances are easier get, to get than tobacco and alcohol because it's controlled and regulated. A vote in favor of this bill does not do the following. It does not endorse the use of drugs any more than we currently endorse the use of drugs or alcohol or tobacco. It will not increase the use of drugs by individuals who currently have no desire, desire to use it. There's a retired judge, Superior Court Judge, James Gray, Orange County, California, and he said that his 30 years on the front lines of dealing with this issue of marijuana and working with juveniles, he said, here's what we have to do in order to, to change our policies. We have to change our marijuana policies in order to achieve the following things. Reduce marijuana consumption by children. <coughs> Stop or reduce violence and corruption that accompanies the growing <coughs> distribution of marijuana. Stop or reduce the crime by people trying to get money to purchase marijuana and by those under its influence. Reduce the harm to people who consume it. Reduce the number of people we have to put into our jails and prisons. That's a superior court judge with 30 years experience. We, we also heard the latest polls that the politic, that the, uh, the constituency is the head, of the, pol the head of the politicians on this issue. It's quickly gaining ground. Here's what the opponents of this bill will tell you. They'll tell you that marijuana is a gateway drug. There's no study or research ever produced that anyone can cite that will support this. In fact, all studies conducted reveal <coughs> the opposite is true. There's no connection. It's fascinating that law enforcement officials will still continue to use this antiquated testimony to support current drug prohibition laws. Opponents of ending the drug war will testify that if marijuana is legalized, that it will be more readily available. The facts are that marijuana is readily available everywhere in the United States right now. It is so available that our children can buy it in unlimited supplies in our schools, which is why passage of this legislation is needed. School children report annually that obtaining illegal drugs is easier than accessing alcohol or tobacco. Regulating this substance is, and, and who could currently access it, is currently what we do not have in our existing policy. This legislation seeks to correct that problem. Opponents of this legislation will tell you that the rate of use among minors will increase if marijuana is legalized. The facts are overwhelming that everywhere in this country and around the world where prohibition is eased, the use of this substance goes down, especially with minors. Some law enforcement officers will suggest to you that if legislation passes, more people will drive under the influence of it. This is preposterous because it assumes that laws dictate behavior. If laws did in fact dictate behavior, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. And of course, once again, there's no evidence to support that claim. Opponents of the bill will say, what kind of message will we be sending to our children if we pass this bill? Here's our current message. This is what we're currently saying to our children with our current policies. We know that marijuana is widely available to you and that there's a very good chance that you will be in its presence and you'll be pressured by peers to use it. We don't know who's selling it to you or your peers or what it may be tainted with. The sellers certainly don't care who you are. We know that the unlimited supply will not end. We know that the 6,000% markup on this widely used product funds terrorism. The current, that's the current message to our children, and we've known that for 40 years, and we simply either do not know or we do not care what to do about it. In the interest of time, Madam Chair and Committee, I won't go on with the endless list of unsubstantiated reasons that opponents will give. I will tell you that there is no evidence to support those claims. In summary, our country will spend approximately $88 billion this year in another attempt to create a drug-free society. It will fail. When we incarcerate a rapist, a bank robber, or an other mala and say criminal, the crimes that they were committing stop, hence the incapacitation effect of incarceration. When we incarcerate a drug dealer, we simply create a job opportunity for another individual who will step in and keep up the illegal supply and unregulated revenue stream coming in. Our policies on drugs should seek to reduce death, disease, crime, and addiction. Our current policies achieve none of these goals. 
this legislation goes a long way toward reducing all the current harms associated with prohibition. <coughs> Excuse me. Please consider <coughs> the facts and honor the evidence. As a voter, I'm hopeful that anyone that is in opposition to this bill will do the responsible thing and provide solid and sound reasoning for his or her actions. To just say no to this bill is ineffective and irresponsible to the citizens of New Hampshire. This is responsible legislation, and I encourage its passage. Thank you for the privilege to testify before you and the committee, Madam Chair. Sir, I apologize if I went over time. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> sir, I heard from your organization uh, 10 years ago about uh, decriminalizing marijuana. What has your organization done at the federal level to change the laws? I personally have been to Washington, D.C. twice. I've walked the halls of Congress. I've talked to congressional aides. Congressmen, when I can get to them. I spoke before the National Press Club on two occasions. I spoke before the Parliament in Ottawa and Canada who asked the United States for assistance with respect to how they should approach their drug laws and legislation that they found. And in last March, I went to Vienna, Austria to attend the 55th Conference of the United Nations on International Drug Policy Reform. Law enforcement against prohibition, and you will see on our letterhead who's on the executive board and who's on the advisory board. And you will see that these are some law enforcement officials with significant backgrounds. Yes, uh, I we, see that because we, they're all law enforcement officers that have put people in jail and found a conscience after 30 years. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. But what we have done is we, we concentrate a heavy concentration of people in Colorado and Washington State to answer your question to try and help legislators understand the issues and uh, the people who are well resume well credentialed, with honorable careers, uh, are moving this issue forward. Um, and perhaps we are at the threshold of a bright future in New Hampshire. I <coughs> that's true. I should think in 10 years that Lee could have done something in Congress. They've well, been there. They, it's been 10 years since I heard from them, and I really think mm -hmm. that if they wanted to do something about stopping the federal government from being over our heads to make arrests if we made this legal, that they would do something. Madam Chair, uh, we put together a very significant report and an analysis based on data that the government themselves produced. I myself was part of the contingency who went to Washington, D.C. to the drug czar's office, Gil Kierlikowski, to present this report with the former chief of police of Seattle the former Drug Task Force Commander for Baltimore, and several others. And Gil Kierlikowski, though he was in his office, refused to come downstairs and even greet us. He asked us to leave the report in the lobby and asked us to leave the building. Now, as a veteran of the military of 26 years, and a 25-year veteran of law enforcement, and a taxpayer who comes from a military family, that doesn't buy too well with me either. I think that the drug czar of the United States owes me that 60 seconds when in Vienna, Austria, I can sit with the former drug czar of the United Kingdom and the former drug czar of the European Union to talk about these issues. And those other countries, by the way, are ready to unravel drug laws, and that's why you're seeing the rebellion in other countries with respect to these drug laws, because the United States are the people who put the sanctions against those countries and force them to go into prohibition in the first place. It's coming undone, Madam Chair, and Leaf has done a lot in 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. I got Dennis. one quick one, if I may. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sir, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding part of this bill that they say that, well, let's not give it to anybody under 21, but why is it so good to give it to people over 21? If it's not good enough for the kids, why is it good enough for other people? Same argument can be made, sir, for alcohol. I don't drink alcohol. I don't abuse alcohol. I don't think alcohol is a good thing. I don't think cigarettes are a good thing. But the fact of the matter is, Representative, there are people in our society always that are going to do it, a percentage of those people. And our choice is accept the fact that we cannot control that behavior but instead, we're going to manage the behavior. That's the difference between the two. There's no way that you can prohibit that substance. There's nothing in this bill that says it's good for you if you're over 21, go ahead and do it. It says uh, if you do it, you're gonna pay for it through taxation, and we're gonna regulate it so that our kids have a more difficult time accessing it. 
So uh, how, yeah. how, how do you expect to manage it? You can nice. grow it, you can have places to get it. These, these are not challenges that are beyond us. This is the United States of America we're enterprising. These, these two states that passed this bill, and New Hampshire will discover this too, that it's a job creation opportunity, it's a revenue opportunity, the Liquor Commission maybe is the appropriate entity to look after it, but the fact of the matter is, it's not going away. And anybody who's in a political office or any taxpayer today who says that laws dictate this kind of behavior is sadly misinformed. It's not reality. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Very cheap. The 2 states that passed this legislation, what are they doing in the face of federal uh, drug laws? I have to um, respond to that question. And for the record, I'm not going to respond as a member of law enforcement against prohibition. I'm going to respond as a taxpayer of New Hampshire. May I do that? For the record? You I, came to us as we. Okay. Uh, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk it and go out on a limb anyway. Okay. Uh, my personal opinion. Uh, is that the, the stark difference between this drug war and alcohol prohibition uh, is that in 1920 to 1933, Congress enacted the 18th Amendment, which gave Congress the right to prohibit alcohol in all 50 states. And with the 21st Amendment, 13 years later, they took that authority back. There was never a convention, there was never a congressional <coughs> amendment that permitted the federal government to prohibit drugs in the first place. In my personal opinion, the only authority the federal government has over this issue is to tax it. They can't prohibit it. And I think that if the attorney generals in these two states, my personal opinion, <coughs> if the attorney general appeal this to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court looks at the constitutionality of the issue, they will find that the federal government has made something illegal that they do not have the authority to make illegal. And it's going to come down like a house of cards. My personal opinion. Thank you very 